what's going on everybody this is john j gaming on the mic here coming at you with a brand new episode of the memphis dynasty here on ncaa 12 one of the underrated ncaa games that we do have and we are here we are in the off season as we try to progress and get ourselves to a point where we become one of the elite programs in college football and at the end of year three i like where we are coming into a brand new conference we end up finishing really good so we'll talk about that and so much more in this episode including also how you guys can get more involved in a personal way in this series so you're gonna want to stick around and watch the entire thing and you can do that by hitting that like button for me and hit that subscribe button as well as you have to be brand new to the channel as that does really help me out in terms of getting this video out to more college football sports gaming fans like yourself so that being said we'll go ahead and check out our schedule and see how things shook out this season so this was a year of transition for our football program as we made the jump from conference usa to an overall stronger conference in the Big East slash that American conference that you guys know today. And what was interesting about our schedule this year is that we started off with conference games. Matter of fact, we had seven conference games in a row to start the season, and we handled that early slate well. We started off with a close loss to UCF, which turned out to not be so bad. They finished in the top 15 in the country. They are number 12 in the final poll. But then we rip off a free game winning streak. We beat Louisville on the road. We also beat Temple in overtime. And we also beat the Cincinnati Bearcats 24-7. After that, we did end up going ahead. And finally getting our first home game late in September. We took on UConn, who also finished the year in the top 25. They were number 19. Uh, but then we lose to Rutgers and finish off our home slate with beating USF very convincingly actually 36 to 6 was that score then the second half of the season we had a little bit more of our non-conference slate we did take on Western Kentucky who had our quarterback that transferred out of program we beat them convincingly and we also beat Navy 46 to 17 that was one of our non-conference opponents as well then we wrap up the season it was a little bit shaky towards the end. We lose close to Houston, 22-24, but then also lose to Notre Dame in overtime as well. A game that I felt that we could have easily won if I made some better coaching decisions down the stretch. However, we did rebound towards the end of the season, beat SMU in our final regular season game. That was a shootout for the ages, and we wrap things up beating Florida Atlantic in the beef Brady bowl so we do finish the year on a two game winning streak as for who ended up winning that national championship this season it was ohio state and oregon that ended up meaning to go and play for that crystal ball and ohio state they had a very tough challenge from the oregon ducks however ohio state does come out on top as they take down the oregon ducks 38 to 31 it was a pretty contentedly uh, well-played game. As for who ended up winning the Heisman this year, real quick, we do have an Ohio State book guy in here. In Eric Wyatt, he ends up finishing second in the Heisman race, but lost at the last minute to Shane Rivers, who made that big push, and he ends up winning quite a few awards as well. Uh, he's representing for Trinity, North Carolina, and we do also see uh, guys like Ricky Yates, Jonathan Stuckey, and Marcus Williams as well get Heisman consideration. For the All-Americans list, I'm just kind of looking around and seeing if we did end up having any All-Americans this season. And I thought we had some good, uh, uh, good players uh, that played some really good football. And we do actually get somebody on that first-team All-American list. It is actually Pat Taylor, the junior from Shelbyville, Tennessee. He ends up getting first-team honors this year, and he did a pretty good job getting to the quarterback. Although it's not eye-popping stats, so I am actually am really surprised that he did end up on the first-team list, but he did have a very good season. Probably those three forced fumbles helped him out. We did, however, not have any other 
all americans this season but we did a little bit better when it comes to being on the all conference list check out the first team all conference list we did have justin brown in here justin brown ended up with over 1200 yards rushing actually no he came in with 1200 yards but then that big bowl game that he had he ends up with 1400 yards rushing and 10 touchdowns to go with it as well hopefully we can keep him in school but with that kind of performance over the course of a long season, I would not be shocked if he tries to put his name in for the NFL draft. But we do have some other first-team all-conference guys. Nate Coleman is in here as well. He ends up getting first-team all-conference nomination. Only a 65 overall, but did a relatively good job getting to the quarterback this season. Almost ends up with double-digit sacks. He ends up with 9.5 sacks over the course of this season. Pat Taylor, you know what's going to be in here. He's a first-team All-American, our only All-American that we do have. But rounding out the first team, we got Zach Scott in here as well. The senior, he ends up with four interceptions and a defensive touchdown. He actually has had a, at least one defensive touchdown in each of the three seasons. Though we did not end up playing with him, so that's really cool to see. And also a true freshman gets in here. Dan Daniel, the true freshman from Hoax Buffalo, Alabama. He ends up with a great rookie season. 45 tackles, two interceptions as well, and also got a forced fumble. Dan Daniel, he was him. Now for the second team, All-American, or not the All-American, but the All-Conference list, we did have more defensive guys. AJ Kaysen was in here. He's a junior from Augusta, Georgia. He had a pretty solid season as well. 49 tackles, uh, 50 assisted tackles. Well, then did a little bit of everything. He was our Swiss Army knife here uh, in our his junior campaign. Also got a safety, so that's really cool to see. We did also get a second custom in there. Josh Meadows, the sophomore from Enterprise, Alabama. He really took a massive leap in his second year. Hardly playing this true freshman campaign. He only had one tackle his freshman year. He leaps up to 35 tackles. He also had multiple interceptions, a defensive touchdown, forced fumble, and fumble recovery. Did make a very big impact on our football team this season. And he definitely deserves those second team honors. As for other second team guys in here, we got Antoine Curtis, the senior from Ruston, Louisiana. Definitely am going to miss him for sure. Antoine Curtis ends up with one interception, but multiple defensive touchdowns. He was a big impact guy for us as well. As for uh, Reggie Franklin, he was our strong safety this year, and he did a very good job of just being a very rangy player for us. Oh, plus not to mention Jason Kelly gets on the All-American list. He was uh, second team here in this, uh, you know, as a punter. But he did more than just punt for us. He also did a pretty good job overall. He had a little bit of a uh, hiccup here towards the end of the season. But still kicked very well for us as both our kicker and punter. So real quick, I want to go over who ended up winning various awards in college football this year. So starting with the Maxwell, Shane Rivers from Maryland. He ended up winning the Maxwell. For the Walter Camp, that goes to another quarterback in the Big Ten, Jonathan Thompson. He's a senior redshirt from the University of Illinois. For the Begnerick, that goes to this Big 12 corner, Derek Ingram. He's a senior from Oklahoma State. For the Nagurski, that goes to Julius Johnson, the senior from Oregon, part of that national runner-up squad playing well for the Pac-12. As for the O'Brien, that goes to senior redshirt Ricky Yates, the Lancaster, California product, playing over for Boise State in the Mountain West. As for the Walker Award, that goes to senior running back Mike Ellis. He's a senior redshirt from Monticello, Louisiana. For the Blinnikoff, that goes to the best wide receiver, Vance Dion Taylor. He's a senior redshirt from TCU and represents well for Farmer Branch, Texas. Meanwhile, for the tight, for best tight end in the country, the Mackey Award that goes to Alvin Bennett. He's a true senior from Penn State and representing Maple Shade, New Jersey. As for the Outland, that goes to the best tackle in college football. That goes to Matt Lake. He's a senior redshirt from Sachs, Alabama. And he also plays 
for the Crimson Tide. For the Remington, that goes to the best center in college football. That's Tate Harris. He's a senior from the University of North Carolina and comes from Lynchburg, Virginia. The Lombardi Award as well goes to Julius Johnson. He's represented that uh, award very well. Best linebacker goes to Stephen Freeman. He's a senior red shirt from Alabama. The four peg going to Derek Ingram again. He's racking up multiple awards. And now for the Groza, that goes to Terrence Garcia, the senior kicker from Auburn. And the punter award going to Kendrick Williams, the junior red shirt from Alabama. However, we do have one person on this list here, at least in that top 10. Jason Kelly does finish in seventh place for the Kyle Guy Award as a senior. In the last award, of course, is the best returner. I believe this is the Jet Award nowadays. Uh, that does go to Gerald Week. He's a senior quarterback from Arizona. With that being said, this was also a year in which we did see a couple of records broken. Jesse Richards now has all but one passing record at the University of Memphis. The two new records that he broke is for career yards and career passing touchdowns. Richards coming out of college with almost 11,000 career passing yards and also with 88 career touchdown passes as well. It was a great season and a great career for Jesse Richards. Speaking of those seasonal stats, we'll see if we have anybody in the top six in terms of NCAA leaders for passing. Jesse Richards finishes in 26 with 3,200 passing yards on the season. Texas Tech quarterback Malloy ends up with 4,700 yards. In terms of running the football, Justin Brown was in the top 10. He had that 1,400 yard season. I think if he ended up going uh, and playing the entire season, he would be in this top six for sure. For the receivers, we actually did not have any major receivers this year. No 1,000 yard guys. Brian Kidd was the closest as our tight end finishes with nearly 800 yards on the year. For tackling, AJ Kaysen does get into the top five. He gets 49 solo tackles over the course of the season. As for second quarterback, Nate Coleman will finish in the top 10 as well. He had nine and a half sacks, as previously mentioned in that Big East All-Conference uh, nominations. And for interceptions, Zach Scott was our leading interception guy. He ends up with four interceptions on the season. And rounding out the NCAA leaders is Joe Kelly, our punter with the longest field goal in the NCAA. He was successful in kicking a 59-yard field goal, which is the longest that anyone kicked all season long. Now, because of our incredible performance over the course of our contracts, we have been offered a contract extension. And of course, those contract extensions are a little bit harder to come by so we earned the second contract, but the second contract going to be a little bit more difficult. This is a contract where, you know, we got to finish in the BCS top 25 to end the season, win 10 games in one season, as well as try to sign one four star or better each regular season. So no fail impact if we don't accomplish that. In terms of things that could impact our job security, uh, signing a top 50 recruiting class each regular season, that might be a little bit more difficult. Win six games a year. We've been doing that so far, as well as, you know, make a bowl game, win eight games in one season, beat a rival opponent in each season. This is stuff that we can definitely handle. Sign five free stars or better each regular season. We've been doing that, as well as trying to get a B grade or higher on 10 campus visits in one season. So that sounds pretty straightforward. As for two things that is going to be really expected of us finish each season ranked in the bcs top 75 and try to finish six or better in the conference each season so if we don't accomplish either of these two things right here that will really hurt our job security of course this is a memphis dynasty so we will sign on that dotted line but with that being said not everybody on our staff chose to stick around as we will end up with a brand new offensive coordinator. Lonnie Tolbert is going to join the staff as he actually does come in from Texas Tech, who you guys saw 
had the number one quarterback in the entire country in terms of passing yards. So that would be a good add to our staff. Plus, A plus prestige certainly does not hurt whatsoever. So I'm going to be really excited to go ahead and work with that. As for where our old offensive coordinator went, Jonathan Grain did accept the head coaching job over at Duke. So he's going to be a power five coach. So I'm really excited for him specifically after the season that we've had. So we'll definitely have to schedule a game against Duke uh, so that we can go up against our old coordinator. However, in terms of players leaving, we actually do have our worst case scenario. Justin Brown does want to go to the NFL. And there's also some other key players that are leaving. Jason Kelly is going to be graduating alongside William Jones and Jesse Richards, who does leave our program with almost every passing record in our school's record book. So going to be missing him a lot. Other players that are going to be key cogs for us that are leaving. Jans Coleman, he's graduating alongside Ryan Towns, Dan Larson, Brian Kidd. And we also say goodbye to Zach Scott, Matt Turner, who was our original starter at running back in year number one. And also Daryl Martin, Antoine Curtis, and a few other guys as well. Quite a few seniors that are leaving. Now, as for Justin Brown, we're going to try to convince him to stay with us uh i'm gonna go ahead i want to spend an hour trying to get this guy to stay because he's gonna he's the best player on our team and after weighing all the options he is going to stay in school one more year so we'll get him to stick around and so having him in our backfield for one more year that's an extremely big deal but one thing that i do want to address is that i want to generally recruit at a much higher level we are a four-star school now, and I think we really need to recruit as if we actually are a three- or four-star school, right? Like, I want to bring in the occasional four- or five-star guy. It doesn't need to be a ton of four- or five-star guys, but I definitely want to do a little bit better than what we've been doing with recruiting right now because we are outside of the top 100 right now. We're sitting at 104. Hopefully, with some signings here in the offseason, we can bump that up a little bit. But I'll let you guys know what we end up bringing in every time we end up signing new players into our program. So with that, we'll go ahead and get through the recruiting period. It's a five-week period. I'll see you guys there when I'm done with that. So right off the bat, we do end up signing a few players. Just in the first week alone, we end up bringing in the three stars, Shannon Austin. We'll, we'll help provide some depth in the backfield as we prepare for life after Justin Brown, which will happen at the end of next season. We also do sign a couple of other players and two star Kevin Fuller. He's a Juco sophomore from North Potomac, Maryland. And we also end up bringing in the one star Juco, Joe Johnson, who will help provide some depth, but we do lose out in a couple of, key, uh, actually lost out on the three star Cedric Smith. I wanted to bring him in really badly, but Troy did offer a scholarship and that was wraps after that. But a couple weeks later in the off season recruiting, we get a three star tight end by the name of Durendrick Jackson. He's from Maitland, Florida. We're able to get him out of Florida. He also took home visits to the Florida Gators and FAU, who we just beat in that bowl game in the last episode as well. So that does take care of our tight end need. And now we just got to continue to hit that recruiting trail and hope that we can get some more people in the door. But we do end up getting somebody in the second to last week of the offseason recruiting cycle. We get Steven Harris. He's a free star punter from Canyon Lake, Texas. Somebody that we are hammering extremely hard. Also had scholarship offers to multiple places. Mid-Tennessee State, Kansas, and Wisconsin. You know, definitely some power five love in there. But we wound him on the home visit. And because of that, we get one of the best punters out of high school to come to our program. Another player that we did end up bringing in for depth purposes is Brent McDonald. He's a one-star Juco from Fort Meade, Florida. And one thing that this does give us a little flexibility to do is that we can move forward and we could possibly move him into the exterior if we need to because we still need a defensive tackle uh, for our true freshman class. 
Otherwise, we could end up with a walk-on on that particular position. So we have our recruiting classes officially finalized now, and we now move forward to making some adjustments to, to positions of some of these guys, particularly the athletes that we brought on to this football team. Now, we brought in two athletes, and the one that I'm excited about the most is Matt Scales. He's a three-star from Adamsville, Alabama. I'm, I have a feeling that he's more of a defensive lineman than anything else, and it looks like he transfers really well to defensive tackle, which is exactly what we need. We definitely need a defensive tackle because based off of what our team needs were, we were looking really short there, and he's actually going to be projected to start here as a true freshman as well. As for this other art athlete, Eric Parks, he was a three-star guy too, but he's only a 53 overall, so I'm definitely concerned about that. Looks like his overall does go up just a little bit when it comes to being a, uh, you know, like a wide receiver or a running back. I don't know what to do with him though, right? We got plenty of running backs on the roster already, although we will have a need at the running back position here in the next couple of seasons. Wide receiver, though, we have a lot of wide receivers, and I was trying to make a concerted effort not to bring them in, but the game did randomly decide, hey, we're going to go ahead, we're going to sign, like, four wide receivers, right? Like, and this was in the last week, too, so I think what I'm going to do, because running back will be of need of ours, not this upcoming season, but two seasons from now, I'm going to go ahead and put him in that running back position. Uh, I don't know if he makes the roster, though, I'm going to be honest with you. Now, one more move that I did decide to make here is I made a little adjustment in our back defensive backfield. So we had three sophomores here, you know, between Trent Bullock and Ed Stanley and Dan Daniel, who's obviously our starter. I'm going to move Trent Bullock over to strong safety just because he's a, the strongest of the three and he doesn't have as much of a chance to start in his college career so i moved him over there to give him a better shot of starting possibly uh and just also i like to have like free safeties in each sign there is going to be a strong safety battle between michael denman eric davis and trent bullock he's going to be the long shot over here uh but michael denman seems like he's a solid safety too now, with that being said, we will go on to training results, and we will have our first 90 overall player, and was someone that we actually did not bring into the program originally, Justin Brown. He's going to be a senior redshirt. I'm just so happy that we brought him back for his final season. He's going to be the main vocal point of our offense, especially because, <clears throat> because we do also have a brand new quarterback Jesse Richards graduating does mean that we had a little bit of a quarterback battle. And Rowley Bell is going to move in. He's going to be our new starting quarterback. He's a little bit more mobile than Jesse Richards. But he does have that same starting experience. You know, he's played in limited action. 7 for 17. 74 passing yards. Touchdown. No interceptions. Uh, not great accurately. But again, we can open up our playbook a little bit more. We do also have joseph thompson as a sophomore red shirt uh as well as dan washington and them uh waiting in the wings as well for the running backs outside of justin brown tooth toothington does uh win that backup job in spring football so we will see to toothington a little bit more ali atkinson year one hero who really had to step in he's gonna be our third string guy uh this upcoming season as well Fullback is the uh, same man. It's Willis for Werda. He's going to step in. He might uh, have to play a little bit of offensive line as well, given our offensive line deficiencies, but we'll also be looking for a new fullback. As for wide receiver, we did bring in a lot of wide receivers, but the receiving core got a little bit better. So that's a good sign. Chris Washington's a burner now with 95 speed. He's our best receiver alongside Willie Duckett. We're going to be looking for contributions from guys like Jamarcus Mitchell, Jody Gentry, IT Thomas, as well as Luke McConnell and JD Howard and uh, Travion Randolph as well. You know, a very, you know, it's not the most talented wide receiver core ever, but it's a group that can really look back on and, okay, you know, there's a lot of options here. At tight end, Steve Bell will now step in as our new starting tight end. Uh, because we did see Brian the Kid graduate, 
So, a lot of new faces on the offensive side of football that I haven't even got into our offensive line. As for that offensive line, offensive line, I think there's going to be some growing pains. A lot of younger guys on the line. Andy Whale is a sophomore redshirt. He's going to step in as our starter, as will Chris Spence over at the left guard position. Over at center, we do have one of our older players in Matthew Hodge. He does win the job in spring ball. But he didn't really make the big gains that I was really hoping for going into this season. Cal Joey did get redshirted his true freshman year. At right guard, we'll have one of your guys' customs in Sheldon Joey. Uh, he'll be there. He wins over Move Movington for the starting right guard position. And we'll have a true freshman at right tackle. So that's going to be fun to deal with. As for the defensive side of football, Nate Coleman does come back. And he's now going to be a 70 overall. So good, good improvement there. David Kraft, though, looks like he will be our starter over at the right end position, though. Still isn't necessarily the fastest. As for defensive tackle, Pat Taylor does uh, get up to a 69 overall, which is certainly nice. Uh, but uh, Tony Marquot moves ahead of Caleb Crawford. Uh, might give Matt Scales a little bit of trouble in terms of fighting for that starting defensive tackle job. For the linebackers, I think the linebackers are going to be the best part of our football team this upcoming season. As Sam Miller has a lot of experience and is pretty good too. He's now a 77 overall, but is a senior. Also, a senior is AJ Kaysen, who is going to be your starting middle linebacker this upcoming season. But we certainly got some talent in the pipeline as well. Right outside linebacker, however, will remain as Josh Meadows. He had to fight off Isaiah McClellan and Greg Copeland for that starting job, however. As for the corners, I think corners is going to be a new cast of guys as LaRue Nugent will step in in the starting lineup and could see a little bit more of Seth Randolph and Chase Gentry this upcoming season. For free safety, Dan Daniel will still be our starter in the free safety position, but at strong safety, Eric Davis will take over. He had a backup role this previous season. So we do get down to one of my least favorite parts of the offseason. We do have to cut some people. And like I said, we since we signed one of our athletes over to defensive tackle, we can go ahead and get rid of this uh, walk-on that's at the defensive tackle position. So that's nice to see. Can't touch these two other guys, though, because they're former walk-ons, and they actually help fill a need for us, right? But for these other five guys, like for this Juco and Brent McDonald, I can get rid of him as can I get rid of Eric Parks as well. Eric Parks is somebody thought was going to be something, but he turned out to be a pretty big bust, so he's going to be gone. Uh, Alexander Gray, I'm going to keep even though he's not that good because that is one of the things I wanted to throw in as a challenge. Custom guys, I will never cut. So Hunter Simmons, I'm going to get rid of as well. Even though we do end up losing that Missouri pipeline, we got a ton of wide receivers. And I honestly want to get rid of some of these uh, a couple other wide receivers too. But I'm also going to cut Drew Denman. We already signed another quarterback, so I'm not worried about the quarterback position that much. But the last player that I am going to cut though, Steve Wilkinson. Uh, just too many wide receivers, right? Too many wide receivers on this roster. He's got to go. And that's all the players under 60 overall that I wanted to cut so that does mean that this is going to be your final 70 man roster but before we even start looking at the schedule and taking a preview for next season we do have some conference realignments that happen around us as for when I get into these older NCAA games I like to reflect the conference realignments as they happen in our timeline so, for the Big East, what ends up happening with us, we're now called the American Conference at this point. So, we end up losing Rutgers and Louisville to bigger conferences. But, we do add a few teams here, and they are from the conference that we just left the season before. Eastern Carolina, Tulane, and Tulsa all go from Conference USA and join us over here in this American Conference. As for where our former conference opponents went, Louisville left for the ACC. They joined the Atlantic Division, where they end up replacing uh, Maryland 
And speaking of Maryland, they jump to the Big Ten, and that's where we find our other conference uh, here, Rutgers. They left the American Conference in order to be a part of the East Division of the Big Ten, which, by the way, this was also the point where they left that Leaders and Legends format that the Big Ten had for a couple of years. It was always real confusing that they did that, but they finally get themselves right. They now have East and West Divisions. But the Conference USA, even though they do lose their conference championship, they do end up adding one team. Western Kentucky does end up coming in to Conference USA. They come from the Sun Belt. And this was also the time that Old Dominion came in, but obviously can't get Old Dominion up in the game without uh, replacing another team. And this was also the time that we saw Idaho and New Mexico State jump to the Sun Belt because the LAC conference was uh, disemboweled. However, because of what the base game was, can only have four teams minimal. So Idaho and New Mexico State, instead of going to the Sun Belt, uh, they're going to stay here in the WAC with a couple of other uh, leftover teams. Sun Belt, by the way, also down to four teams as well. So this is what we established was going to be our final 70-man roster. And now before we take a look at the schedule, let's go ahead and see who's going to be red shirted this upcoming season. Now, a lot of our red shirts are going to come from the offensive side of the football because that's what needs dictate. And Robert Irby, who is our three-star quarterback that we signed this past season, he's going to be red shirted because he's actually slated in as the third string quarterback but i think dan washington can fill that role perfectly fine and we give him an extra year to develop him does have some jesse richards in him as for the running back position we have a lot of upperclassmen at the running back position and therefore it makes a lot of sense to redshirt shannon austin going to be deep down in the gallows of the depth chart want to set him up so that he can potentially start his senior year of course, at wide receiver, it is well documented that we have a lot of weapons at the wide receiver position, and it just makes sense. Ernie Jude and Robert Johnson, two guys that are just not going to see the field anytime soon, so I thought it also made sense to go ahead and redshirt them as well. And then the last two red shirts that I made were on the defensive side of the football. I ended up red shirting Jonathan Ross because he was competing for that starting quarter job. He was really trying to push Willie Mason. However, that being said, just could not come out on top. So Jonathan Ross is going to be a backup. And we have some depth in Kevin Fuller and Seth Randolph and Chase Gentry. So I feel like we can redshirt him and allow him to be great in the future. And also redshirting Joseph Miner, who is also a freshman corner. I'm redshirting him for similar reasons. But this is what our schedule is going to be looking like here this upcoming season. And a lot more regular of a schedule right we won't have all these conference games at the beginning of the season instead they're going to be towards the end of the season right so i am pretty excited about that so what we got going on here is we have duke who our offensive coordinator is there at he is now the head coach of the duke blue devils so we will play him uh get a little bit of a coordinator versus head coach thing going there that's our first game of the season and then we host ole miss who's ranked number 17 in the country. Now, in season number one, we did played against their rival, Mississippi State, and they took us to town, but we're a better team, and we're a better NCAA 12 player in general. Could be an exciting game. Then we start our conference slate with the Tulane Green Wave and the Tulsa Golden Hurricanes, two of the newcomers in the conference. Before we wrap up our non-conference slate, we'll take on New Mexico State at home, then we'll have a bye week before we go on the road to go up against Michigan State in our final non-conference game. After that, we will ramp up the regular season with six consecutive conference matchups. We go on the road to play against Connecticut. Then we go home to play against Southern Florida. And our last four include Temple, Cincinnati, the ranked Houston Cougars, and the SMU Mustangs. We'll wrap up our season once again. But this upcoming season, we're at relatively the same place that we were last year. Not really much different in our overall. We're a 75 overall team on offense and a 67 on defense. 
But with that four star, there's some respect in this conference. We're going to be picked to finish fourth out of 11 teams. And we're going to be a dark horse to win the whole thing. Going to be able to compete with the likes of Connecticut, Houston, and UCF. Uh, who are right in that same tier of teams as we are in terms of having a legitimate shot of winning the Big East this year. But that's going to wrap things up here for the offseason recap. As next episode, we will get season number four underway. I got a good feeling about this season, guys. Got some great things, you know, building momentum from our recruiting. In our first game of the season, we will have a rematch against our old offensive coordinator. We'll be taking him on in his second game as the head coach of the Duke Blue Devils. We're going to see if we can prevent him from getting our his very first win as a head coach against us. But guys, it should be a good episode regardless, man. And I hope you guys are excited for it. If you are, make sure you go ahead and smack that like button for me. Hit that subscribe button as well. If you do happen to be brand new to the channel, this is John Jake Gaming on the mic signing off. Hoping you guys are all out there having a good one. Take care, everybody.